right, so this is module A10, building the case for dams and levees. So with our learning objectives, um, at the end of the module, hopefully we should be able to combine integrated information into a coherent argument, distinguish key evidence to support the risk estimate, describe uncertainty in the risk estimate, and outline and recommend a path forward. So the dam safety case, is a, it's gonna be a logical set of arguments and it's used to advocate a position that either safety, rela safety related action is justified or that no additional action is needed. So it's intended to present or be presented in a rational, to present the rationale in a formal and methodical manner to convince decision makers to take responsible action. So the dam safety case supports the risk estimate and then together they're going to be used with the risk doc guidelines that we discussed earlier in the course so that we can make uh, consistent decisions. Now, an important point is that the case is built throughout the risk assessment. It's going to require um, creativity and judgment to try to string together several simple arguments together to make a coherent and compelling argument. Much of the evidence we use to build the case is going to be project specific but where we can get additional support coming from indirect evidence like case history and empirical data. So when we're talking about project specific information, we're talking about your design and construction details, site characterization, your geologic details, project performance, any kind of instrumentation data you have, and then also analysis and modeling. But if we're gonna build a complete case, we need to build it for each of the three portions of the risk equation. So that's gonna be the loading, that's gonna be the system response, and that's gonna be the consequences. So for each part of the equation, we're gonna need to clearly state the key parameters that drive the estimate. We need to state any model limitations and assumptions as well. Said another way, we need to clearly state what we know and what we don't know and how what we don't know could change the estimate. Let's start with the loading. So for the stage frequency curve, you're going to need to be able to explain the uncertainty in the peak flow frequency and the basin average rainfall, along with how the rainfall runoff parameters and inputs might vary. But most important, at least to me, is that you're going to need to be able to explain the shape of the curve. Why does the slope of the curve change? Why does it flatten out? So like in this particular instance, you see the flat part of the curve there in the middle, um, particularly above top of active storage, that's because we've got still a flow going on, keeps the pool down until the flows become too large, and then the pools rise as a result of greater inflows. For the probable maximum flood, if it changed from a prior study, we're gonna to need to understand and communicate why. We need to highlight what is driving the peak reservoir elevation, what parameters are uncertain, and then the sensitivity associated with them. It's also gonna be prudent to identify how future studies may improve the analysis. For the seismic hazard curve, answering the questions of what is the source of the earthquake and site, what's the site classification, what is the maximum credible ground motion, return period, and then along with the seismic hazard, we're going to need to identify the coincident stage thresholds and the flowing probabilities. A helpful tool that can be used to help you estimate the coincident loading of an earthquake and elevated pools is going to be your RMC Joint Loading Probability Toolbox. You can find that on the RMC website. I think Tiffany covered this a little bit earlier today, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But what I will say is if we're going to select threshold values for system response and uh, or special values for the system response based on our earthquake threshold and flood threshold, we're gonna to need to be able to support the threshold values that are chosen. We have to have a very good reason as to why, which takes us into building the case for the system response. Generally, the system response can go one of two ways. You'll either be making the case for a low probability of failure or a high probability of failure. So for a low probability of failure, it's usually gonna boil down to just a couple key factors. Either we have a critical loading that's very infrequent, or perhaps we have a continuous flaw that just that we need, but it doesn't exist. Or our gradients aren't high enough, or we have a filtered exit, things like that. For a high probability, though, we're going to have to discuss every node of the event tree, 
because every event has to occur for that problem or for, for that failure mode to occur. Now, so although we're gonna you know, discuss every single node of the event tree, some nodes might get more discussion than others. Some are simpler than others. Just, just keep that in mind. So for this first example, we have a backward erosion piping failure mode and it's being judged via the low risk. The risk is gonna be low because we have a properly graded filter that's based on multiple tests and there is low potential for segregation and the construction control procedures were excellent. So again, we, we've drawn the pathway here. You can see how the pathway goes through the filter. So part of this case is gonna be making sure that we prove that that material will filter the foundation, will filter the foundation material and that there's no flaws or issues with the filter itself and talk about the construction and all quality control procedures that were done. So it's one thing to list the evidence like shown on the slide, but then to adequately make the case, you have to document why um, as implied by the actions that I've got listed there in the parentheses. So for making a case, your entry is gonna be your road path. For in this particular instance, we got each node is gonna get a sentence or two to summarize the key factors that drove the S. The event tree toolbox, you can find that on the RMC website. This can be used to help you create a, a figure like this with the event trees and with the callouts. Now, in my opinion, these event trees are very, very powerful tools. They can put the entire justification for the risk assessment of a potential failure mode together on one page. And it's very helpful for a reviewer. Now, the TAM safety case, though, is going to be a further summary, and it's going to focus on the key nodes and factors. So for this particular example, we did have continuous uniform fine sand in the foundation, which is concerning. But again, the probability of failure was low because we had the foundation soils excavated and replaced on the downstream side. They put in a filter and drain. The foundation seepage is now filtered, and, it's, and in the very unlikely event that we get past the inclined drain, the foundation gradients aren't high enough for an elevation 2615. And that has about a one in 5,000 annual exceedance. So we need a pretty large event to have enough gradient for that to occur. But either way, it's probably going to be filtered in the first place. So how about another example? So in, in this one, we have an eye wall with a high probability of failure during overtopping. The case for this one is primarily based on the analysis of landside scour and structural modeling of the wall. So what gives us confidence in the model results is case studies from similar walls from New Orleans that failed under similar loading conditions. Like the prior PFM, we have the justification for the failure mode presented in one page with an event tree and callouts. But in this case, because the probability of failure is high, the number of events in the tree is going to basically match the number of key factors that we're going to need to make the case. So again, if you're going to make the case for a high probability of failure, it's important that every node be discussed. Now, when we start, when we get into making the case for potential failure modes and even analyzing them, detailed drawings can be another very helpful way to convey information and ultimately to support the case that you're making. They're critically important to understanding the project and it's a foundation and really putting all the subsurface data into one place forces the risk assessment team to take a look, a critical look at the data. You can sketch failure paths on the drawings and ultimately it's gonna help foster a more consistent understanding of the failure model. I'm gonna go through a few examples of some pretty good detailed drawings. This particular one is from Bolivar Dam. Uh, we're analyzing backward erosion piping in the foundation. Um, we have boring data with soil classifications, the moisture content, gradation plots, photos of each foundation layer, piezometric response, all thrown into this one drawing. Uh, since we've been through internal erosion, I'll ask you real quick, looking at these three layers, we've got the nitrogen blanket, we've got the upper outwash, and we've got the lower outwash. Of these three, which layers can be most prone to backward erosion pipe? The lower one. 
very, very good because it's very even for us. So you get a straight line on the page plot. That way you can find all the particle cycles are essentially the same. Uh, what are a few other factors or conditions needed for a back erosion pattern? A stable roof, yep. What else? Sufficient gradient. Sufficient gradient both at the exit and then along the entire pathway for, um, for the pipe to progress. There's a couple others, but I think we're good on that. All right, so this uh, next drawing example comes from uh, J.E. Ralph Dam. In this particular instance, there was some anonymous anomalous sediment and there was concerns about karst potential. So it was thought that the observed settlement may have been a result of internal migration into karst rock. But as you look at this drawing right here, the rock in the area of the settlement was exposed and they had a special treatment area of, and it was a 50 foot wide zone where they completely cleaned off the rock. They treated it with flesh grout and things like that. So without the, and you can see where it lines up with the area in which we're getting uh, the high settlement. So without the presence of large defect in contact with the embankment, it's very unlikely that that observed settlement was a result of internal migration in the foundation. You can see that really quickly just by looking at the plot. So then this next one, this is Salinas Dam. This, this particular drawing was put together for a failure mode where we have an earthquake that leads to failure of the right thrust block by sliding within the foundation bedrock. So these annotated images, the stereo net, the drawing of the right abutment, and there were several other great drawings that I didn't include on this slide, but they all illustrate the main geologic and structural features that were ultimately used with other information to help evaluate the kinematics of the right abutment rock wedge positioned in the right abutment. Now, risk assessment teams must also build the case for the consequences of failure every bit as rigorously as the other two parts of the risk equation. So we're going to need to know where people start out, how they evacuate and move, do they stay in a structure, what kinds of structures are typical, can the structures withstand the flooding, how much water do they get, how deep, how quickly, how likely are they to lose their life, all the things that Jordan discussed uh, earlier this week. The fatality numbers that come out of life sim are important. Don't get me wrong, but it's more important than just the number. We need to understand and to be able to explain why the results are the way they are. So a complete case for the consequences is going to discuss the breach parameters. You'll discuss flood wave arrival times, depths, and velocities. It's going to discuss the population at risk, where they're located, when the warning is likely to go out, how much time people have to evacuate. Again, Keep in mind, these are not certain parameters, so sensitivity of the results to these parameters also needs to be discussed. So while the mean and expected values can be used as the primary means of managing dam and levee safety portfolios, there's a lot more to it than that. So understanding the basis for the risk estimate is just as important as the risk estimates themselves. For example, if we've got two modification alternatives, it's possible that the mean risk reduction may be similar between the two of them, but one may be more reliable or one may be more certain to be effective. The other might be very difficult to construct properly. So this, this is why our decisions are made based on all relevant information, not just our mean estimates. So why do we try to quantify uncertainty? First, it's required by policy, but beyond that, we do it because it helps risk assessment teams evaluate the problem more thoroughly and to anticipate, try, anticipate the best we can the unexpected. It's going to give our decision makers more information and a better understanding of what the risk assessment team thinks they know, and again, what they know they don't. And then again, along with the uh, analysis of sensitivity, it can also be used to inform additional studies and help make the case for future investigations and data so deciding on future actions, we need to think about the factors that most greatly impact the risk. We're going to think about how sensitive the risk is to these factors, and then the cost of taking additional action either through investigation or modification, and then what potential exists for reducing uncertainty. Sometimes, 
further study is going to be very helpful. Sometimes it's not. But by considering the possibilities and the most critical factors, we can better predict which it's going to be and hopefully choose the most appropriate course of action. So I bring up a paper that was written by uh, Greg Scott, Nate Thornton, and Carl Dice. There's a couple quotes in that paper that kind of stuck with me. Uh, first is, it is presumptuous to believe that we are capable of obtaining a single precise number that truly represents risk. And then the second is, since uncertainty is inherent in each claim, the argument should also address whether confidence is high enough to stand on the basis of existing evidence. So the risk number or the estimate itself is important. It's supposed to be an accurate representation of our degree of belief. But at the same time, we need to be humble enough to understand our limitations and admit that, you know, sometimes we're not going to know everything and do our best to work hard to try to figure out when we've identified uncertainties, how that might result the result, impact the result and the ultimate decision. I've got three examples up here, and we're going to just try to decide, you know, will more information change this result? How about this first one? Do you think more information is going to change the decision in any way? This is hard to see. It says, with intervention, when we ran our analysis, we got 89% of our iteration results plotting above the average annual life loss standard. More information will change our decision there? Probably not. Probably not. It's unlikely to change the decision, or at least the full order of magnitude above the guideline, and we've got about a 90% chance that it's going to stay there. So we probably won't do anything further on that. How about the next one? So that one we've got 97% plotting below the average. So again, for a lot of the same reasons, just on the other side of the guideline. Additional information analysis is probably going to take the decision. How about the last one? Two and a half plus orders of magnitude of uncertainty. That would very well may change the decision. It depends. It depends on what, um, I guess, what the uncertainty is associated with. Is there something that we could do to reduce it? Things like that. Here's a particular example of a sensitivity analysis that can be used to make the case for additional study. So the plot on the left plots the hydraulic gradient versus the probability of uh, backward and erosion piping progression, which is really sensitive to the uniformity of the continuous sand foundation. So the more uniform the sand, the lower the coefficient of uniformity, and the higher the probability of progression. And you can see on the right what it does to the risk. The coefficient of uniformity is two. We're almost an order above the average annual life loss guideline. If it's at four, which is still a pretty uniform sand, it plots more than an order below it. So if we don't have enough gradation data to know what's you know present in our foundation, it's probably best to recommend some sampling and run some fit analysis to get some better gradation data. Now. We do risk assessments to inform decision makers and to make good decisions. There are going to be three possible outcomes of a risk assessment. I don't know why those came in different order, but we can take action to reduce risk. We can um, recommend and carry out additional investigation and or further study, or we can do no action. Now, when we recommend additional investigation or further study, that can apply to all three parts of the risk equation. All three parts, the loading, the system response, and the consequences. When we are confident that the risk is spot above the average annual life loss guideline, pursuing risk reduction actions are going to be justified. So similar to what we saw in that prior slide, but it's the exact same thing. Um, we got two orders of magnitude of uncertainty, but because so many of our iteration results plot above the average annual life loss guideline, we're probably not going to do anything to try to reduce that uncertainty. Now, when confidence is low, such that we could have additional information that might change the perceived risk, either up and down, we can evaluate the value of getting more information and then make a risk-informed decision. 
Any action proposed based on uncertainty must address the sensitivity of the mean risk estimate to that uncertainty. So that said, we don't wanna spend more money investigating and analyzing than it would cost to uh, lower the risk by remediating. So keep that in mind. So here we're gonna move into an example of a potential failure mode associated with uh, foundation liquefaction. So we got the plot on the left that shows where the risks plotted after a, an initial risk analysis. Now, risk plots above the average annual life loss guideline. It was determined that the estimate of the risk is very sensitive to blow count uncertainty. So for you non dirt people, a blow count is basically a measure of density. So the higher the blow count, the denser the soil is. So the original estimate was based on data from six original boreholes, which are in unfortunate locations. And in fact, one is so bad, it doesn't even show up on the, uh, uh, on the slide here. So this provided strong evidence that the recommended investigation could reduce uncertainty. So they came back and they put in 22 new holes after the first analysis. And the decision was to add them based on the risk cost. So the team thought that low count densities from that they would get from the red holes were going to be higher than what they were getting from the downstream tow. That's for a couple reasons. First, they're the dewatering soils near the cutoff trench to the rock, and then second, the increased load that's uh, imposed by the dam. And you know what? They were right. So the higher blow counts and changes to the risk dropped the expected value almost in order of magnitude, and the decision was made not to modify the dam for now. So before an investigation, a risk estimate can actually help you make a decision to explore versus going straight into modification. So in this particular example, the risk cost of exploration is about a 16th of the es estimated cost of the structural risk reduction actions that the risk costs. Um, so the cost suggests that the exploration is gonna be a good economic decision, even though there was only a 20% chance that a repair wouldn't be necessary afterwards. Does that make sense? So if we just compare the cost of just repairing it versus the cost of repairing it and exploration, the difference between 8.5 and 8.1, is that a million? Yeah, a million is not that much in the grand scheme of things when you consider that you got a 20% chance of only spending, you know, less than $500,000. So again, keep the cost of the investigation in mind relative to the cost of the potential modification. I think it was Mohawk. Mohawk in where we had something that plotted near the average annual life loss guideline. We could have done more to explore, but instead we just put in a couple of relief wells and it's cut. And then lastly, for this part, uh, when we're confident that the risk plot above the average annual life plot below the average annual life loss guideline, there's no justification to reduce risk. Um, we'll take no action, but we'll continue regular inspections and evaluations of the facility. As mentioned previously, we need to make sure the risk estimates and the recommendations are going to be consistent with the data that we have. So there are some questions here listed on the slide. These are the questions that we ask our independent reviewers. We ask them, you know, are the risk analysis and the associated uncertainty explained and portrayed adequately? Do the portrayal and level of risks agree with your understanding of the project's condition and its ability to withstand potential loads? What key information leads you to believe that the risk estimates are reasonable? Do the level and the portrayal of risks support taking action to reduce or better define risks? Do they support the proposed recommendations? So answering these questions honestly is gonna be a good way for teams to check their work. If you cannot say yes to the first, second, and last questions, and you don't have a good answer for the third one, you're gonna need more work to build the case for your risk and or the risk estimate itself might need to be revised. In the case of the risk estimate, you need to develop structured arguments. You need to provide evidence as to why your estimates and evidence are reasonable. You need to provide justification to take action or not that is consistent with the case that you're presenting. And then lastly, you need to identify sources of uncertainty and communicate how much these uncertainties can change the estimate and the decision. With that, I'm going to leave you with one more quote from Greg Scott uh, that sums things up pretty simply and concisely. 
Again, he tells you cite the evidence that supports the case for why the risk estimates make sense and therefore why the recommendations make sense. This all needs to be consistent. 